Hello, everyone. Welcome to People's Dispatch. Uh, so the World Trade Organization had its ministerial conference last week, which concluded on Friday. Uh, and uh, uh, th this conference was to take place in November, but had to be postponed because of Omicron variant that emerged at that point of time. Uh, so finally, the meeting happened. And it was uh, a meeting which was being looked forward to by everyone in the health sector across the world, because it was going to discuss something which we have been working on, everyone has been working on for the past almost two years, uh, 18 months to be precise, and that is the TRIPS waiver. Uh, so the ministerial conference had to discuss this very important issue. Uh, uh, just to give you a brief TRIPS waiver, this was a proposal that had been uh, forwarded by uh, India and South Africa, the two governments, in October 2020 in the World Trade Organization in the midst of a raging pandemic. And both the countries uh, asked the World Trade Organization that all types of intellectual property, be it patents, be it copyrights, be it trade secrets, they should be waived off for all medical products related to COVID-19. Uh, that could be medicines or vaccines or even ventilators, uh, diagnostics, everything. Um, the text, the final text after the ministerial conference, the decision that has come out is not so close to what India and South Africa had proposed uh, in October 2020. Uh, so this is what we are going to discuss today. We have with us uh, Gopa Kumar, uh, K.M. Gopa Kumar, uh, who's a legal researcher uh, from of uh, Third World Network and a very well-known access to medicines activist who has been following uh, patents and trade secrets and other intellectual property in the health sector for decades now. Uh, and we are going to, uh, un uh, we will expect, ask him to unfold uh, what happened at the ministerial conference and uh, why do we have the text that we have now. Gopa, uh, welcome to People's Dispatch. So obviously my first question is going to be, how do you read the text that has come out, uh, the final decision that has come out from the ministerial conference of the World Trade Organization? The text uh, which has, uh, or the text or the decision which, uh, which is part of the uh, 12th ministerial conference basically addresses a small issue that is uh, the facilitation of uh, export under a compulsory license. Article 31F of the TRIPS agreement normally uh, restrict the export uh, of, uh, of any products which is produced under a compulsory license only predominantly for domestic use. So that means countries who do not have the uh, capacity to produce uh, a pharmaceutical product, uh, including vaccines, cannot. Uh, obtain the uh, obtain a uh, vaccine or a uh, therapeutics under a compulsory license produced from elsewhere, right? Because uh, that country cannot export exclusively for uh, for for uh, 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 for another country. But this issue was resolved in two thousand five through an amendment. Earlier, it was a waiver in two thousand three. So uh, this is called 31 bits of the uh, TRIPS agreement. But the pro process involved uh, to avail that facility, that means process uh, involved to uh, produce and export predominant portion of it to an another country under Article 31 bits involves cumbersome procedures. So till now only there is a one example of uh, invoking Article 31 bits. Um, so uh, this decision uh, reduces some of the conditions under the 31 days and facilitate any portion you can export under a produce under a compulsory license. So to that extent, uh, this the scope of this decision is very limited. First, to the only to the vaccines, and second, uh, the, the 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 freedom of uh, operation you are obtaining under this decision is limited. It is only for the to facilitate the export under a compulsory license. So in a way, it cures some of the uh, problems involved or cumbersome procedures involved uh, in, uh, in the Article 31 bis. Uh, only to that extent, it's a uh, it's an important step. But otherwise, uh, this does not offer anything new 
to provide a uh, freedom of uh, uh, operation which goes beyond the existing flexibilities? The answer is no, it doesn't go that extent. Though the original proposal uh, by the uh, India as well as South Africa, and, and I would say that all 63, other 63 co-sponsors goes beyond the existing flexibilities, but this decision fails to go to that extent. And it's, uh, that's, where, uh, uh, that's where this decision is uh, very limited in scope. So basically what India and South Africa had asked for is a uh, waiver of all types of intellectual property for all types of medical products. But what we have got is uh, only patents to be waived only for the vaccines. And uh, that also not uh, in an ideal form uh, because the TRIPS agreement and some provisions were already allowing it more or less. Yeah, this, uh, uh, this decision uh, waives Article 31F that's obligation under Article 31F. That means uh, it, now you have the freedom to export any portion of what you produce under a compulsory license, first thing. And second, it clarifies certain provisions of the agreement, including obligations under 39.3, which deals with the trade secret. Article 39.3 basically obligates countries uh, to keep the information contained in the drug dossiers or vaccine dossiers as a trade secret. But there are two exceptions to protect public or uh, or to avoid uh, to, after taking measures against unfair commercial use, you can disclose. There are these are the two exceptions, right? These are existing, but nobody has used. But this uh, decision also clarifies that nothing in 39.3 prevents you to enable the effectiveness of this, uh, this, this uh, decision. That means if you issue a compulsory license, the regulatory agency can even share the drug do vaccine dossiers or the drug dossiers. So in this case, it's vaccine dossiers to another company and facilitate production. So this is a, uh, an additional clarification which is uh, given uh, in the uh, decision. But so what does this decision mean in practical sense? Which are the countries uh, who will be export or not being able to export? Uh, we are hearing about China, that China will not be able to make use of TRIPS waiver. So can you uh, clarify that point for us a little bit? So that, uh, that footnote, which uh, uh, specifically targets uh, China by stating that uh, whoever, uh, whoever declared known use of the decision on 10th of May are bound by that and other countries are also encouraged to do so. So uh, this is a kind of a contradiction. The whole idea of this decision is to facilitate export under a compulsory license. But the footnote says, the countries who are having the capacity is encouraged not to use it. So we should understand that only a few countries are having, especially a few developing countries are having the manufacturing capability in the vaccine space. And when they are encouraged to opt out, then who is going to export? So um, we like to uh, wait and see. And uh, this export should take place not only with the uh, political will of one country, which would like to get it imported, but it's also like many other factors like economy of scale. There should be sufficient orders. And then um, somebody who are having the manufacturing capability should be able to uh, export. So um, the practical use of this is uh, heavily depending upon the, uh, not only political will, but the uh, economy of scale. Uh, so therefore we like to wait and see, but I am saying that there is a contradiction in the footnote one, which basically encourages countries who are having the capacity to opt out. So that contradicts with the very objective of the decision. All right, so, um, uh, we saw the negotiations go on for uh, approximately 18 months. Uh, I would like to ask you what uh, was happening at the backstage because we have been following this issue. How were the developed countries, a few of them, were able to actually suppress the demand of more than 100 developing countries to come to a much more radical conclusion and uh, from where we had started? I mean, we reached a disaster text. It seems like that uh, WTO and the 
so W2 has actually kneeled to the big pharma and profiteering of the big pharma. But what was happening at the backstage, if you can explain a bit? I think the pressure was mounting slowly and steadily for a waiver, uh, what is envisaged in the original proposal. Um, but at the same time, we are also be realistic uh, in the sense that you may not get what all you want, but to an extent where it is workable, right? Uh, so we all know that uh, that's a, a reality of any negotiation, especially forums like WTO. But around uh, November 2021, it became very clear that without a decision on waiver, nothing is going uh, will move forward in WTO, especially the EU style of uh, you know, WTO's response to pandemic. So it became very clear, and uh, the uh, the WTO ministerial was. Uh, uh, cancelled that time due to uh, the uh, outbreak of new variant. Then uh, the DG, that's the Secretariat, uh, uh, took an initiative involving four countries known as now Thod, uh, that involves EU, US, uh, uh, India, and South Africa. This process continued for four months and resulted in the text which was leaked in uh, around uh, first week of March and uh, or second week of March and then we saw the uh, a slightly modified version of the text uh, came out uh, or tabled by the DG uh, around 3rd of May. The text-based negotiations was based on that DG's text. We started on 17th of May and continued uh, for a month, almost a month. Um, the negotiation continued and uh, we have this decision. So when you look at the context to now, there is not much uh, major changes. There are changes which, uh, 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 which are uh, from a developing country perspective removed much of the damages involved in the text. The earlier text involved many provisions which goes beyond the current obligations under the TRIPS agreement. That has been removed in many places but there are a few areas, it still remains. Um, but what went wrong from a developing country perspective is the court process. So India and South Africa involved in the court process and we produced this text, which is by and large based on the use demand. You, please recall, you also tabled a text around June uh, for further discussions, but it was not a waiver. It was based on a compulsory license, clarifying certain provisions of the compulsory license provisions. So uh, this text is uh, the architecture of this or the structure of this text is based on the EU proposal. The uh, court process basically resulted in silencing of India and uh, South Africa uh, during the text-based negotiation. I, I would say they did speak, but the proactively um, engaging in the text, uh, that means the, co the court text is below minimum below the expectations of uh, the, uh, you know, when you, when you look at the uh, revised proposal of the developing countries, in, uh, the, the 63 six, or 65 uh, co-sponsors, it is below that expectation. So naturally we expect that uh, these two, uh, uh, what you call uh, the, 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 uh, 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 the, 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 uh, sponsors of this origin, original sponsors of this text would proactively engage proposes the language to improve the level of uh, uh, the text to a new level or to the uh, expectation that did not happen because both these countries voluntarily kept silence uh, saying that uh, they participated in the court process so they are not in a position to suggest new language that way i think uh, it was a trap the court process which basically bought silence from india and south africa and that resulted in a text which is you know a highly skewed uh, text uh, which has a the utility which i mentioned to you is only reduces certain elements of certain elements of uh, uh, the Article 31 discomfortable procedures, yeah. Right, right. Uh, so the green room, the famous green room tactics, as we know, where uh, countries get silenced and obviously it is usually the developing countries. Um, but if we zoom out a little bit, we also know that there were many other uh, proposals on table at the WTO. It they were related to agriculture or fisheries. 
and the others do you think those negotiations and uh, would have also mattered saying that you can get something in the fisheries do not push for the trips favor in the health sector ha did that also happen at the level of ministerial in that week in the last week i don't think so uh, there might be exchanges happening with the other uh, other uh, areas but uh, you know the trips waiver tax was not worth to exchange for something else at that stage you know when the ministerial started it is already watered down the tax so no sensible country would exchange uh, their uh, key interest in the area of agriculture or even fisheries for a trips waiver so uh, so we were headed to this text anyways uh, that's what you would need yes. um, but but so what we have now is that after two years of hard work by a lot of activists and uh, civil society and people and a support of more than 100 countries uh, from across the world and seeing the kind of disaster that we saw during covid-19 pandemic because of lack of access to medical tools uh, despite all of that build up despite all of that mobilization from the common people uh, uh, and uh, led by health movements uh, we have a text which does not really help us improve the situation uh, at all um what is the road ahead for the common people and for the activists and the civil society now how do we come together because uh, this has created at one level a lot of expectations among common people also what can be done uh, but what is the road ahead then according to you of course uh, we ended up in a skewed text and uh, it's a matter of uh, disappointment for uh, most of us uh, involved in the process but i would say uh, you know as an activist i am eternally optimistic and uh, we all uh, are uh, you know share that optimism too um, what is uh, uh, this 18 month uh, campaign um, achieved uh first uh it conveyed a clear message that the there is nothing sacrosanct about the trips agreement and the, if the agreement needs to be critiqued and it needs to be debased in the coming days uh, you know with uh, more uh, uh more more uh, campaigning and more push for that and there is uh, no need to accept the agreement as it is and uh, there is a need for it clearly shows that the intellectual property can not only patents the but the trade secret the copyright and even design can affect the access to health uh, health care that's the first point second point um it forced uh, eu us and many other developed countries who were critic of using trips flexibilities to say that please use flexibilities you don't need waiver you can use the flexibilities right right and right. third yeah and third uh, it exposed the how the regulatory system uh, rigged in favor of uh, uh, in favor of uh, uh, big companies and protecting their trade secret in the name of protecting quality and safety and efficacy of uh, vaccines and uh, biotherapeutics so uh, these are some of the key learnings from the process but uh, we also notice that uh, the uh, uh, our own uh, developing country uh, governments uh, need to understand this in a better way and uh, they should understand uh, the uh, the fact that whatever may be the human crisis the pharma is not going to blink its eyes and the government support them uh, is not going to uh, agree even for a humanitarian ground so that means politically our governments needs to build our own local production capacities our own science and technology capacities um, and to create a favorable enabling favorable or enabling environment uh, to maintain that capacity so the conventional trade theory that okay you can get the medicine wherever it is cheap why do you maintain this is being seriously questioned these are the uh, takeaways uh, for me uh, in the coming days perfect thank you gopa and uh, yes to more work at the global level at the national level and i think we need to continue working on all forms of intellectual property and i agree with you that uh, uh, we have been talking a lot about patents but 
how other kinds of intellectual property can damage uh, an equitable response is something that uh, uh, a lot in the health movement have learned over the last two years and uh, hopefully we will keep working towards it. Thank you again for being with us and uh, uh, we hope that you will continue your fight the way you've been doing for the past. It's not my fight. I think we all need to uh, uh, carry our struggles and our campaigning at the national level and uh, then come to the global level. I think we would be able to change the thing and uh, with one decision, the fight never uh, or the struggle does not end here. I think it will lead to, I'm sure it will lead to more uh, organized and more um, um, uh, more uh, uh, strong, uh, you know, uh, struggle in the coming days because we are better informed now. What are these uh, guys are up to? We know the the fallacy behind the intellectual property rights uh, and its uh, implications on access. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Gopa, for being with us and sharing your important thoughts. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.